So one of the things I always found crazy in medical school was that some people would spend hours and hours reading over lectures or spend days in the library on topics that I get through in less than 30 minutes. Now I get it. It's easy to feel like you're being productive and learning by sitting down in front of your books for 12 hours straight. But what if I told you that there is a way to study more effectively in less time and still have room for things that help you to consolidate what you've learned, like going to the gym or getting enough sleep, and also fit in all the things you want to get done with the rest of your day other than studying? So when I studied for my surgical exams around my day job as a surgeon and running a seven figure business on the side, I had to be efficient with my time. And so I needed a different approach to processing and remembering content that I was seeing for the first time. The method that I used is based on learning psychology research and is evidence-based. And I'm surprised that more people don't use the same techniques and still default to sitting at their desk until they fall asleep. So in today's video in the evidence-based learning series, I'm gonna break down the system that I used and still use to this day to process new information, encode it into my memory, and then ensure that I understand it and can apply it in as little time as possible while staying hyper-focused and motivated when learning. And although I studied medicine, the principles can be applied to learning pretty much anything, whether you're a high school student or a corporate learner looking to learn as efficiently and effectively as possible. So grab a cup of green tea, hit that subscribe button, and let's get into things, starting with how I build context and relevance as quickly as possible when I encounter new information to save a ton of time while everyone else is still in the library. So the first way that I say loads and loads of time and stay efficient when learning is to completely switch up how I approach processing new information. While most people will start on the first page of their textbooks, online lectures or video courses and grind through until the very end, I start from the end and work backwards to help build context. So why is learning new content in its intended order so inefficient? Well, the first time we encounter anything new, our brains actually aren't that good at immediately processing and understanding the new information. If you don't have any existing related knowledge, it's difficult for our brains to understand how the information is relevant and link it to our existing memories. Think of your brain like a computer. If you save a new file but don't have any similar files or a folder structure, you're probably just gonna save that file to your desktop or anywhere else, and then it can be hard to remember the name of the file and actually find it quickly when you need it. And maybe if your desktop or downloads folder gets messy and takes up loads of space, you just move everything to recycle bin to make some extra space. We've all done it and your brain is just the same. This is why it can feel confusing to read a new concept or topic for the very first time. You don't necessarily have sufficient context to help your brains identify that it's relevant. You can't link it to any existing memories and you can't move it to your long-term memory as you develop that understanding. This process of getting information into our brains is called encoding, which is the input of information into the memory system. Once we receive sensory information from the environment, our brains label or code it. We organize the information with other similar information and connect new concepts to existing concepts. Encoding information occurs before the storage stage and so organizing what you're learning is really, really important. Remember, our brains filter information, deciding what's important enough to save from our sensory memory to our short-term memory, and ultimately into our long-term memory. In terms of efficiency, if you're reading through new concepts in your textbook or listening to a video about something new, you'll probably end up wasting time going back over that new content by either rereading or rewatching it to try and memorize it or build deeper understanding. So it always made sense to me to build structure around a new topic first and go gradually deeper and deeper to build understanding quickly, starting with understanding the simplest, most basic principles of that new content first before diving into the more specific information. For example, if I'm learning about the neuromuscular junction, I don't just read through and try and memorize that acetylcholine is broken down in the neuromuscular junction and recycled by acetylcholinesterase. That's much deeper, more specific knowledge. Instead, I'll start by first building some scaffolding of knowledge around the new topic. I'll look at the key learning outcomes and we'll jump to the end of the book chapter or lecture and just quickly get a top level overview of why it's important to help build relevance and give my brain that folder structure and system. I'll then start with something more basic like understanding what the neuromuscular junction actually is and why it's important. And I'll test myself on this before moving on to more advanced concepts. I'm spending time helping my brain organize new information and linking it to topics I already know. And this can be broken down into a couple of key stages. Firstly, skim reading. 
In practical terms, I'll skim through and quickly figure out how the new material is organized, focusing on the headings, any diagrams, and key learning outcomes without worrying too much at this stage about testing myself. The second part is then focusing on the key concepts. I'll go through and focus on what the key concepts actually are and how well I know them. I'm not worried about the details here, but I'm looking at diagrams, tables, and explanations and seeing whether my brain perceives them as hard or easy on this first pass. During this stage, I'll be writing active recall questions rather than just passively reading, so I'm staying productive and actively learning. I don't get hung up on new concepts that I don't know, and I'm not wasting time going over and over tougher concepts and facts like 99% of people who are sat in that library. I tackle the hard concepts in stage three, which is when I focus on things I don't know quite as well. Stages one and two will have built relevance and highlighted the new information your brain perceived as hard. Stage three is really about breaking down the harder information you skipped and coming back to it to ensure understanding and help your brain to encode it. Because you've now already built relevance and identified related concepts in stages one and two, you've given your brain a nice framework to then understand the concepts you originally felt were harder. This will make absorbing and encoding the new information so much easier. At this stage, I'll also read around the topic to help further build relevance and use evidence-based techniques like active recall and the Feynman technique to ensure that I can explain harder concepts and test myself by applying the knowledge. You can think of this process like peeling back an onion, just like Shrek says. You're focusing on the structure and easy concepts first to build context, and then you're going deeper and deeper to learn new or more complex topics rather than just reading through it in the suggested order, as this is a lot less efficient. To get a bit deeper into this, let's look at why spending ages in the library or sat at your desk overloads your brain and how I keep my cognitive load focused to get quality work done in less time. So there's something called cognitive load theory that emphasizes the limited capacity of our working memory, as opposed to the near unlimited capacity of our long-term memories. It states that processing too much information at once can lead to a cognitive overload in our working memory. This overload can slow down and hinder the learning process as it has a negative impact on the transfer of information from working to our long-term memory. The theory isn't just about helping students remember more either. Occupying our cognitive resources with irrelevant or excessive information can lead to just very inefficient learning, whatever it is you're taking on. Avoiding cognitive overload means undertaking a more focused and concise approach to learning. So if you're reading through a book chapter that's pretty wordy, or you're watching a video from someone who isn't that great at explaining things in simple terms, chances are you're going to get overloaded with information that isn't critically relevant to what you're learning. Remember, books, lectures, and videos are all created by people just like you and me, and they can easily wander off topic and bring in their own experiences that means what they're teaching isn't actually that concise. And learning psychologists have even given a name to this, the redundancy effect. When a learner's working memory becomes clogged up by unnecessary, redundant information, they may remember the irrelevant information and forget what they actually need to know. So if you're sat in the library right now, reading through a 45 slide presentation, or listening to someone go wildly off topic, try and question what is relevant to your own learning needs against your curriculum and your exams. When I approach learning new information, I'm obsessed with staying efficient and aim to cut out anything irrelevant and focus on the topics that are high yield or that I'm worst at, and then simplifying this information and linking it to things that I already know to build that context. Now to understand how I reduce my cognitive load when learning in a little bit more detail, Let's look a little bit more into the science. Cognitive load theory was published by John Sweller in the journal Cognitive Science in 1988, and the concept of cognitive load was further broken down into three key concepts, intrinsic cognitive load, extraneous, and germane. Intrinsic cognitive load is simply the complexity or difficulty of the new information that you're learning. And to reduce this, I'll try and simplify information and find easy to understand explanations or go through pre-made worked examples that break down complex topics. Extraneous cognitive load refers to how the topic is presented to learners and is basically what we've just talked about, getting overloaded with unnecessary information. For example, if you're given loads of text to describe what a square is, it's probably not as effective as just showing you an image of that square. If you're having to jump between different mediums like text, images and videos to actually understand the topic, this is actually called the split attention effect, and it causes you to lose focus 
by jumping between multiple different sources. This is why I'll usually spend the time researching the best learning resources and skimming through new content to pull out the most important points first to ensure relevance. Finally, Domain Cognitive Load is the processing, construction and automation into schemas. It was first described by Sweller in 1998, almost a decade on from his original work on cognitive load. In simple terms, Domain Cognitive Load is all about linking new content to our existing knowledge and organizing it appropriately. A schema simply means something that organizes categories of information and the relationships among them, and this really links back to building context and ordering our knowledge. So now I've organized my knowledge and provided context, and I've reduced my cognitive load to stay efficient. Let's look at how I'll use active recall as I go along to ensure that what I've encoded is being stored in my long-term memory. So Karpik et al. believe that students get illusions of competence from rereading their notes and textbooks which is why people find it so tricky to adopt active recall as they're convinced that rereading works despite the evidence and people just spend ages in the library reading over their notes. One reason for this illusion is that the text contains all the information, so it's easy to glance over it and feel as if you know it well, which in fact is not the case and why I'm way more efficient than most of my peers at medical school. For me, testing myself and trying to recall information as I go through it on the first pass of learning hugely helps my understanding and speed of learning. So as I skim over the new information and go deeper and deeper into the more difficult topics, I'll be constantly testing myself and creating active recall questions. One of the simplest ways I do this is to just cover the sections of the textbook or the slides that I'm learning and test myself to remember the key facts. I'll usually ask myself things like, can I explain what I've just read? Or can I redraw that diagram for each new short section that I encounter? If I can't, I'll go back and remind myself and then try again before moving on. This is really important as if you can't recall the information, you simply haven't learned it effectively. And for me, testing myself has been the single most impactful thing that I've changed up in how I learn and it's helped me to retain information for way longer. So why are some folks still sat in that library for 14 hours? Well, it's much easier and more comfortable to passively read from a book and feel productive, whereas building context and testing yourself is much more effort initially. But in the long run, it's so much more effective and most importantly, it's way more efficient. The other thing I'll do with Active Recall is to jump into question banks and past papers early and try to get through as many questions as possible to test my knowledge and the application of that knowledge as I learn along the way. This is much more efficient than just testing yourself towards the end of your study period and jumping into questions that require you to apply your knowledge and then figuring out how to do it is much faster than simply reading an entire book and then practicing testing yourself and using worked examples to reduce cognitive load and focus your brain on key information needed to solve a problem. So my final tip here is how I stay laser focused. Getting distracted and procrastinating is a surefire way to prolong learning. So the other way that I learn more efficiently than others is that I'll set myself up to really focus on what I'm learning and I'll work for three to four hour intervals when I know I'm sharp and can get that work done. Over the years, I've built up a habit and a routine to ensure that I can work and learn without distractions. I'll make sure that I time block out learning sessions in advance. And for me, I'll usually get up and go straight to my desk, which I've prepped the night before, and then just get down to working and studying. I'll have some lo-fi music on, or if I'm away from my desk, I'll pop on my noise canceling headphones and I'll set myself a target of questions for the day that I feel is achievable. The other really important thing I do here is to not overwork myself. As we know, both sleep and exercise massively help us to consolidate what we learn. And so I'll make a conscious effort to take breaks, which helps me to stay focused when I come back to what I'm learning. Equally, if I do get distracted or maybe I'm a little bit tired, I don't beat myself up about it and I'll make sure I take an extended break before coming back to studying. Lots of people feel guilty about taking breaks or doing things other than learning. And this can lead to anxiety and stress, which is a bit of a vicious cycle as if you're feeling a little bit stressed or anxious or feeling you have work hanging over you, you're gonna be distracted and less focused. So stick with the process, don't spend hours and hours in the library and make a conscious effort to build context, focus on relevant information, test yourself as you go along and avoid distractions and burnout. And that's pretty much what made me way more efficient at learning than anyone that I was at medical school with. Now in this video, we've talked a lot about encoding and understanding what you're learning as well as active recall. And I have some awesome videos that have received some really great feedback on these topics, which I'll put up in the end cards right over here. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks so much for subscribing. I hope this video is really helpful. And do let me know about any learning hacks that you use in the comments below. And I'll catch you again in the next video.